Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Now, if you live outside of the United States, there's a good chance that Despicable Me 2 is already playing at a theater near you. And here in the United States, it opens on Wednesday. But interestingly, they haven't really done a lot to advertise this film, at least when you consider that it's a family animated pick. Usually they just flood the market with advertising for these kind of movies. And even though we've seen a lot of the minions in the last week or so, I feel there's been a real lack of focus on the human characters in the film. You know, the ones that we all fell in love with in the original film, like Gru and his daughters, but also this new villain, Eduardo, which is supposed to be a major asset for the franchise because it, it, you know, it's meant to appeal not to only to all audiences, but especially to Latino audiences. And as we all know from the Fast and Furious franchise, and even End of Watch, uh, about a year or so ago, that's a very strong demographic worldwide, globally. South American box office is huge, and also here in the United States. Uh, but I think the reason they weren't really able to advertise what was supposed to be a huge asset for them is what happened with Al Pacino. Now, I did a whole movie by covering this, but uh, the, the, quick, the quick version is, is that Al Pacino was apparently unhappy with the, his work on the film, the way it was going. Illumination Entertainment must have known things were kind of heading off the edge of a cliff because they didn't showcase Eduardo in any ads, as I said, or the Al Pacino's involvement, really, which, which is also a major trump card for a series about villains. And, of course, Pacino famously play, uh, played, uh, you know, Michael Corley Leone and Tony Montana. Uh, but anyway, about two months before Despicable Me 2 was set to open, Al Pacino dropped out. And luckily they replaced him with an actual, uh, you know, uh, Latino actor, Benjamin Bratt, which I think is, uh, which I actually think is a better match for a character that's supposed to appeal to Latino audiences. Uh, and they also did it quickly, so it kind of squashed the story and they didn't have too much bad publicity for the film. But still, even so, they have not really done a lot to advertise this aspect of the movie until this weekend. Uh, I was happy to see a Oh, a Spanish language, semi -span I guess a semi-Spanish language ad come out. I've included a link to it below in the video description. And it's interesting, it's quasi, I say, because Benjamin Bratt does a Spanish language intro to the advertisement. Uh, I did not do very well in high school Spanish, I'm afraid, so I don't know what he said. Uh, and then, but the clips from the film are in English. And I guess that's because this is advertising meant for the United States, and the film will be playing in English when that audience goes to see it, whoever's watching the Spanish language ad. But uh, I liked what I kind of saw in the villain. We're still not really seeing him speak. Uh, Benjamin Brad, I was researching the film this weekend, writing my open for the uh, movie review that'll come out on Wednesday. And it was interesting to see that, you know, Benjamin Brad was very, very candid about the fact that he had to match his performance to the animation that had been done to match Al Pacino's performance. So, you know, his hands were a little tied as an actor there. But from what I've heard, he's done a really fabulous job. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if this asset that they've added very shrewdly, I think, from a commercial standpoint, uh, works creatively in the film uh, and also helps them at the box office as it's intended to. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, what you guys think. Do you, does it make, do you, for those of you who are, are of uh, in the Latino audience, does it matter to you to have a Latino character in the film? Uh, do, are, are you, does that make you more likely to see Despicable Me Too, or are you going to go anyway? And also, what do you think of what you've seen of the villain so far? Do you think that it, it's, it does a good job? Do you think it's too stereotypical? And, and what do you think of this Spanish language advertising that Benjamin Brad is spearheading? It's obviously something Al Pacino couldn't have done. And do you think they're using Eduardo and Benjamin Brad enough? Uh, you know, they're really hiding, I think, as I said, what I think is a, a very interesting part of the film and a major asset. And they seem to be hiding the whole human cast. We'll see how that advertising pays off. But I'm excited to see Despicable Me Too, as I absolutely loved the original. Uh, now, speaking of sequels, uh, there was some interesting news that came out last week. Is that Taken 3, it looks like, is a go-ahead. Now, you might recall that Liam Neeson famously said after Taken 2, I don't want to make any more of these. Uh, and I love his quote where he said, how many times can his daughter or his family members get kidnapped? Because at that point, it really becomes bad parenting. Uh, I thought that was fabulous. But you know what? When Fox and Luc Besson offer you $20 million for the third film, I think your, your concerns go away. So that's what's rumored, that Liam Neeson is nearing a deal for $20 million to reprise his role. I think he, I believe he made about 15 for the second film. So that's just phenomenal. And why wouldn't he do it? Because not only did the first two Taken films make so much money, the second Taken film was made for only $45 million and made like $376 million worldwide. That's huge. It's like a license to print money. I, I don't blame Fox for wanting to make a third film. And I saw Taken 2, and while I think we had a very weak story moments, there, I would say there was a good, you know, I'd say at least a third of the film that was really fantastic action-packed sequences uh, running, running around. I think, I believe they were... Budapest or Istanbul, I forget exactly where it was, but it was great. And I, I remember it because there were a ton of movies shot there that year, running across the same rooftops, which I thought was interesting. But uh, I'd see a Taken 3. 
Uh, and I think Liam Neeson would be silly not to take the paycheck. It's a huge paycheck for him. And if you look at his box office track record, as I did right before I filmed this episode to just double check what the Taken films had grossed, uh, you see just how many movies he made between Taken 1 and Taken 2 because he became such a hot commodity to Hollywood because they saw how much he was bringing people into the box office. And how great is it to see a guy, an actor in his 60s, still be a very viable, incredible action star who gets paid the big bucks? I think it's wonderful. I think it's really exciting. I, as you know, I love to see Hollywood uh, think outside the box and not just do the stereotypical, uh, you know, stuff they always do. So that's uh, Taken 3. They're, they're also working to sign Maggie Grace and Famke Janssen. And since they don't really have anything to do, uh, I would be surprised if they didn't sign on as well. So the third story for the day, a number of you asked me to talk about the fact that the Academy, the, you know, the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences that runs the Oscars, invited about 270 new people to join the Academy this year. That's about 100 more than last year. And so people made a big deal of, uh, about the fact, the industry made a big deal about the fact that, you know, they were trying to, like, uh, widen their, their demographics as well in the Academy, because I think that they've seen that their voting is a problem for them uh, in terms of ratings. So I, I guess you can argue whether or not the Oscars should be concerned with ratings, but I think if you're going to air the Oscars on television, you should be concerned with ratings. If they want to make it a private ceremony and do whatever they want, fine by me. But uh, so they, they, made this, they had this thing, and they put 276 people, and they invited in a huge slew of documentary uh, people, which I thought was interesting. But they also had people like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, uh, Mila Jovovich. Some people were like, why should Mila Jovovich get to join the Academy? That's ridiculous. And I would say Mila Jovovich is the star of a very successful franchise. And so I don't, I think that if you want to broaden the views of the Academy, why not, you should bring in people who make different type, types of movies. I think that's kind of snob, snobby to disqualify someone who does work prolifically in the film industry to great success just because you don't like the kind of movies she makes. But also, uh, the you know, interestingly, Jason Blum, who I uh, interviewed recently here on the show, who produces the Paranormal Activity franchise uh, and also... Uh, the Purge, he was invited in, uh, and you know, also a lot, just a lot of interesting choices. Oh, Steve McQueen, I thought was an interesting choice, the director of Shame, uh, Hunger, and the upcoming Twelve Years a Slave. So I think they had some interesting people that they brought in. Uh, however, I would say that the politics are so entrenched in the voting at this point for the Academy Awards that I don't really know that bringing anybody in is going to make a huge difference in the results. I think what's really happening is that you have all these people who now get to benefit from the swag and the favor uh, that is given to the uh, motion picture arts and sciences voters regularly from the studios. So that's kind of what it is. It's more like, hey guys, you want to come in and get some awesome treatment and swag and under the table gifts? Uh, welcome aboard. Not so much like let's change the way we, uh, we recognize achievement in film. I think the only way that's really going to happen is if the Academy is not done by industry-wide voting, but you have like a select ju jury like you do for f film festivals like Cannes, uh, and maybe also a few regulars who, were, who are associated with the Motion Pictures uh, Arts and Sciences group that their sole goal is to try and to be open-minded. If you can get someone who's a, like a curator. You know, I would almost say like a Robert Osborne type on Turner Classic Movies. Someone who isn't in the industry, who's removed from the politics, and is really looking at this from the viewpoint of history. Uh, that maybe would perhaps help with, with, what, uh, with what's going on. So that would be actually my recommendation. I think that when you have industry-wide voting, it just becomes political, it, it becomes a, a networking situation. Because, um, you know, people are, who's going who's gonna to take a stand and be like, yeah, I'm going to vote for this movie that I believe deserves it at the expense of my career and alienating myself from my fellow uh, Hollywood players? No, nobody's going to do that. I mean, that's why it's so hard to fight corruption and everything, because you get into the system and all this, you get into the system to change it, and all of a sudden the system's working for you. So, uh, and there's just so much money at stake. So I, I think it's nice for these people. I'm glad these people are now part of the Academy. It's wonderful, but I... I I'll have to see it to believe it that any widespread change is going to be brought in. Now, as for the question for the day, uh, some of you have asked, you know, just a few of you, but I wanted to address it. I've said, well, why don't you put pictures into morning movie news like you do your other videos? And I, the short answer is, is that I just simply do not have the manpower uh, to do it or enough hours in the day. Uh, to, if I was to put pictures in here, it would limit what I could say because I, you know, because I have to get this up at a certain time. I'm trying to get it up around 10 a.m. every morning Eastern Standard Time, uh, and, and it would take hours to put that in. That's one of the reasons that comics to movies over on Think About the Ink, where I talk, uh, you know, I have a guest on usually Alan Kistler, and we talk about the evolution of a comic book character from the page to the screen. Those episodes take so long to get up and are so inconsistent because the the, the amount of material needed to just to go along with the you know the open 
the openness that we, Alan and I have when we're discussing a character just takes forever. So you would not get a morning movie news every day. You would be lucky to get one once a week uh, with those kind of media needs, having to search for the media, put it in, edit it, uh, and it, it just wouldn't make sense. And it would go against what the show is supposed to do, which is supposed to be a fun, quick, um, you know, snapshot of the morning movie, of the news that morning from the film industry that I can just get up and talk to you guys about. Uh, so I apologize though, uh, and if you ever want me to clarify something that you don't, you know, instead of having to go look it up yourself, I read the comments for this at least uh, for the first 24 hours. And so you just write down a question you might have and I'll be happy to come in there and fill in the blanks as best I can uh, in a comment. So that said, thank you for watching every day. I I'm, I'm having a great time talking to you guys. Uh, write down what you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions you'd like answered. Thanks for watching. Bye.